From MTN News, this is Montana This Morning. Good Thursday morning. It's 4.30. Welcome to Montana This Morning. I'm Victoria Hill. Thank you so much for getting your day started with us. And I'm Ed McIntosh. First, I'd just like to apologize. And then we'll go on and take a look at what's happening with the first interstate ICAM. It's the not your fault, no matter what. Don't let people tell you it's your fault, because it's not. Just the messenger. Remember that. Just the messenger, Ed. Thank you, Sensei. <laughs> Let's go ahead and take <laughs> a look and see what's going on this morning. We have light snow showers in the area to get started today. So it could impact your travel, mainly because we have some slick spots and visibility can be impaired at times. Right now sitting at 26 degrees, it's not going to get much warmer than this all day. In fact, temperatures could start to slide as we get in the afternoon. You add in a little bit of a northwest wind up into the heights around the airport, and it feels more like it's in the teens first thing today. Yesterday, we had a high of 37 degrees and uh, then the low at around 30. But the bigger story was we picked up a little additional precipitation and we're now a little over a foot of snow out of this current round of cold and snow. The real heavy stuff as far as snow potential comes on Friday. But this morning, let's talk about temperatures, teens, 20s across Montana, northern Wyoming. A couple of 30s are sneaking in there like Mile City at 31, 33 in Warland, 25 in Cody this morning. And with those temperatures, we also have those light snow showers and just enough of a north breeze that's going to continue to hold in some of that cold air. Temperatures today really just kind of wobble around in the in the 20s. We'll start to see a little bit of clearing later in the day. Some light powdery snow here for the morning and then a little sunshine in the afternoon. We're going to break down the uh, the details of the really cold and really snowy part of the forecast when I come back in a little while. Well, this isn't it. Ooh, oh, oh. Oh, well, here come the villagers with the pitchfork. So you better I'll... dodge those tomatoes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Ed. Well, thank you very much for that update. And remember, not your fault. OK, I'll get to the news. Thanks. Thanks. Our top story this morning, the U.S. government issued a warning about what it said were attempts by Iran and Russia to interfere in the presidential election. The director of national intelligence said Iran and Russia have separately obtained American voter information. He said Iran has been sending spoofed emails designed to intimidate voters, incite social unrest and damage President Trump. Officials did not provide more specifics or say if the voting infrastructure was breached. Plexiglass will divide President Trump and Democrat challenger Joe Biden in tonight's debate. Also keeping the two separate, a mute button that will give each candidate two uninterrupted minutes to speak at the start of each topic. Their campaigning continued on Wednesday. The president returned to North Carolina for a rally. Biden stayed in Delaware to prepare for the second and final matchup between the candidates, while former President Barack Obama stumped for his former vice president in Philadelphia. The Senate Judiciary Committee is set to meet today to recommend Amy Coney Barrett's Supreme Court Justice nomination to the full Senate. Senate Democrats on the panel plan to boycott the vote, which is not expected to derail it. Democrats argue Republicans are rushing Barrett's confirmation before Election Day. The GOP-led Senate plans a rare weekend session aimed at confirming Barrett on Monday. In crime news, authorities are investigating a possible school shooting planned for next Monday at West High. Billings police say at this time the threat does not appear credible or imminent. Officers received a tip the shooting was being discussed online. They are taking it seriously, being joined by the FBI to determine the source and if there is a possibility the threat could be real. We'll update you as the investigation continues. In education news, School District 2 officials are disputing a New York Times report claiming they're using a loophole to cut down on student close contacts. The Centers for Disease Control used to define a close contact as someone who spends 15 minutes or more within six feet of someone with the virus. The report said students were being told to move around every 15 minutes, so if one of them were to test positive, their classmates wouldn't count as close contacts, cutting down on how many students will have to miss days. In a letter to principals, Superintendent Greg Upham did recommend disrupting the 15-minute timeline when possible, but he says it was all about safety. If we can disrupt the time uh, without gaming the system, to be cognizant of that. And so that's, that's what our intention was. A couple of communiques went out to say move students every 14 minutes. That was not the, the gist of the meeting. 
The Billings Teachers Union filed a grievance over educators' working conditions after the New York Times report was published. Upham sent a letter to parents and teachers clarifying his position and says the grievance has now been resolved. So we mentioned in that story the CDC used to define a close contact as someone within six feet of an infected person for 15 minutes or more. Well, that's because late yesterday they changed their 15-minute language. Now they're including scenarios where people spend that amount of time over a 24-hour period. For example, if you're within six feet of an infected person for five minutes in the morning and then another 10 minutes in the evening, the CDC said the changes were spurred by an investigation in Vermont where correctional officers became infected after brief interactions with positive inmates throughout the day. Continuing our coverage, Billings Teachers Union members and the school district have agreed to a new contract. In a vote on Wednesday, the 1,000 plus union members overwhelmingly supported the new terms. It includes a raise and a one-time $1,500 essential worker payment. This is a one-year deal based on the extraordinary circumstances teachers face during the pandemic. It's the year of cancellations and now a local Christmas tradition is getting the axe. The 36th annual downtown Billings holiday parade has been canceled. A reverse drive by parade was in the works, but county health leaders said it would violate existing orders. Officials with the downtown Billings Alliance say changes are also in the works for this year's Christmas stroll. But there is some fun news. New holiday decorations will be hung for the first time since the 1960s. The the county's response to the pandemic will be the topic of discussion at a Billings press conference later today. Governor Steve Bullock will be in town to speak, joined by Health Officer John Felton. We'll have full coverage of the event on Q2 today at 2 o'clock, and you can also watch it online at KTVQ.com. Turning now to some news from across the state, a Bozeman woman is facing felony deliberate homicide charges for trying to poison a six-year-old boy. 49-year-old Sharice Anderson is accused of giving the, ch the child Ambien pills, then telling him he was going to die. Police were called to reports of a possible poisoning earlier this week and found the boy vomiting and hallucinating. He was transported to the hospital and is okay. Anderson told police she couldn't remember what happened and denied any involvement. Her bail was set at $250,000. In western Montana, authorities are investigating a suspicious death near the town of Hot Springs. Authorities were called to a business there for reports of a woman floating dead in a swimming pool. She was identified as 39-year-old Carrie Allison. The Lake County Sheriff says a man was temporarily held in connection to her death, but he's been released with no charges filed. Allison's body was taken to the Montana State Crime Lab for an autopsy. In campaign news, more than 240,000 Montanans have already made their choices in the upcoming general election. MTN's Jonathan Ambarian takes a look at the votes that have come in so far and what they mean for the last days of campaigning across the state. With just under two weeks until election day, a large portion of Montana's votes are already accounted for, and that changes how campaigns will spend their final days. As of Tuesday evening, the Secretary of State's office reported nearly 638,000 ballots had been sent out to Montana voters. More than 243,000 have already been returned. That number jumped by 35,000 compared with the day before. About two-thirds of the submitted ballots have come from Montana's seven largest counties, Yellowstone, Missoula, Gallatin, Flathead, Cascade, Lewis and Clark, and Ravalli. They sent out a total of nearly 427,000 ballots and have accepted almost 162,000. Lewis and Clark County has the highest turnout so far among large counties, with almost 49% of its mail ballots already returned. Four others have gotten more than 40% of ballots back. Gallatin has processed about 29% and Flathead has processed about 22%. The number of Montanans who voted absentee had been rising for years, even before Governor Steve Bullock allowed counties to switch to all-mail ballots during the pandemic. What happens is instead of having one election day, we have multiple election days. David Parker, the chair of Montana State University's political science department, says with so many votes in, campaigns get diminishing returns from traditional ads, so they'll likely refocus to try to motivate those who still haven't turned their ballots in. Now campaigns have to shift their resources in ways that are less blunt, in ways that are more targeted, specifically to those voters that they know have not returned their ballots yet. Parker says it's possible about half of the total vote in this election could be in by the end of Wednesday. 
In Helena, Jonathan Amberian, MTN News. In the June primary, which was conducted entirely by mail, Montana voters returned more than 60% of all ballots, and total voter turnout was the highest for a primary in decades. All but 11 counties are holding mail general elections. The candidates in the race to become Montana's next governor have both been deemed for campaign finance violations. The Commissioner of Political Practices says Republican Greg Gianforte transferred $180,000 from his primary campaign to his general election election campaign. The law states that money must be used to pay off debts from the primary or be refunded. Democrat Mike Cooney improperly accepted a $710 donation last Friday. His campaign says the donation was simply mislabeled and they will correct the error. The commissioner will negotiate a civil fine for each campaign for committing the violations. And as election day nears, experts warn the internet is being overrun with misinformation meant to distract voters and undermine the election process, especially on social media. CBS's Chris Martinez has more on what you need to look out for. Scrolling through his Twitter feed, Cole Fremet encounters all kinds of political posts that he says are works of fiction. I mean, I even had my mother send me something that her friend sent her on Facebook, and it was so blatantly incorrect, um, but they still think like, well, it was on Facebook and Facebook is legitimate, so this has to be legitimate. Targeting voters with misinformation on social media isn't new, but experts say this election cycle is seeing the highest volume of falsehoods ever posted online. We do see things targeted to different groups of people and sometimes uh, by age groups. Kave Waddell with Consumer Reports says this year voters are being flooded with false posts from various sources meant to undermine the election process itself, including lies about when, where, and how to vote. Some of them just say, um, you know, you can text or, or call in your vote this year, which of course isn't true. Um, you can only use a mail-in ballot or um, vote in person. Social media companies like Facebook and Twitter say they are working to stop the spread of misinformation online, even removing posts that include false claims. But the question is, is it enough? You know what? I don't think they do enough. Voter Nina Concepcion says most of the false posts she spots online have already been shared hundreds or even thousands of times, often before they're flagged. And by then, the damage is done. I think people read things on the internet, believe it, and then that reflects in how they vote. She hopes more voters will take the time to do their own research and help stop the misinformation spread. Chris Martinez, CBS News, Los Angeles. Experts say a lot of online misinformation targets specific groups, most commonly older voters. Also making headlines this morning, the FDA says it will take an extra step in approving a COVID-19 vaccine. With rush trials, the government agency has decided to ask outside scientists for their input. Later today, a federal advisory committee will reveal its current standards for the vaccine. Then it will debate with scientists whether the guidelines set for vaccine developers are thorough enough. The FDA commissioner has promised not to cut corners in approving a vaccine.